Hey everyone, this is Lori Fetrick, and I have a special announcement right now, and that is this. So really pay attention if you can. And that is if you go in and you rate and review my podcast, what I'm going to do is I am randomly going to choose one person per month. Yes, one person per month. I'm going to grab and I'm going to have you come on to my podcast and we're going to do a rapid fire. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. It'll get some audience participation out there. And I want to give back. So this is me giving back to my audience. So please go rate, review my podcast, and I will pick at random one person per month to come on my podcast and do a rapid fire. So thank you so much. And go right now and rate and review. Hi, everyone. I'm Lori Fetrick, and you are listening to Chillin' with Ice. And today's guest, I am so excited about. I actually met her at the New Mexico Comic Con. She is known to be, I, I mean, this, look at it. So here's the thing I am stumbling, stumbling on this a little bit because when I told people who I was interviewing today, they got so excited because she was April on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle show. The turtles, yeah. the turtles. And they were just like, oh my God, this is my childhood. I'm so excited. She has done so much more than that, though. She's known for so much more. She is known also for being Tandy on my favorite, and that's Nashville. <laughs> she is part of the entire Halloween series franchise. And I would like to introduce and welcome Judith Hogue. Thank you so much for taking the time for being on my oh, podcast today. Are you kidding? I am so thrilled. When we met each other, it was like kindred spirits immediately. <laughs> yes. Immediately. I would have been, and you said, do you want to do the show? I was like, oh, I'll follow you anywhere. Oh, thank of you. Course I, would. Of course I, I have would. been doing so much research on you and I have found some fun, fun stuff about you. <laughs> but I mean, we're going to get into the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Nashville if we have some time because I'm limited with you today. But more know, than so anything, here's my question. Here banging around, it's um, my contractors. We are doing a major remodel and I can't hear everything a thing. got sped up today. So suddenly they were doing floors and it got oh incredibly loud. Well, I can't hear a thing. So that's perfect. Good. Good. My question to you, how old were you when you decided that you wanted to become an actor? Oh my gosh. I was little, little. I grew up in, in the de the age of the Brady Bunch, um, Mary Tyler Moore, The Carol Burnett Show. I, I grew up watching I Love Lucy. So from a very young age, I that was what I wanted to do. I originally had thought I wanted to be a Playboy bunny, but <laughs> I realized that um, uh, that, that was not going to be a solid career choice for me when <laughs> um, my mom took brought me into a room and said, tell everybody what you want. I think I was like four, maybe five. My grandfather used to have playboys in his basement and i love the way that they'd all dress up in their tableaus yes. and i thought that was great and if i could look like a bunny like that i was all in even at five <laughs> and um and so my mom said tell everybody what you want to be and i told them that i wanted to be a playboy bunny and the entire room of adults melted down laughing and i realized that they were not laughing with me they were laughing mm -hmm. at me and that in that moment it was like oh no i'm gonna be an actress and that was it. And I started telling people, and I don't know, I would imagine you're kind of the same way. Correct me if I'm wrong. If you tell somebody you're going to do something, you have to do it. Oh, 100%. Yeah. 100%. And the more people you tell, the more you have to do it. And I knew that I was doing that to myself because it takes a lot. So you put it out into the I universe. Was young. What's that? You, you literally put it out into the universe that this is what put you're going to do. Into the universe this is what you're going to be. It, they, it delivered. It was interesting because there was no in my because I started so young and I had this vision, there was no I never wrote the story of failure. I only wrote mm -hmm. the story of success. The story of failure actually came after success came because now you had something to actually lose. Mm -hmm. And and, you know, it, it's kind of a paradigm shift. And suddenly, like you're in the hustle club. Yeah. The grind machine. You have such a positive attitude and you've been in this industry for years. And I, I for really years, do. For like I mean, 40 years. I envy you that you are just an amazing actress. And, you, 
And you have kept this wonderful positive attitude. And what how do you how do you actually keep that up when the industry can be so brutal? Well, I mean, that's it. Uh, what does not kill you makes you stronger. And so I I am a person, I am not a religious person. I'm a very spiritual person. And mm-hmm. so for me, from a very young age, it was like being on the hero's journey and on a quest. And I could see how my career and my life were, and my it's like art and life were doing this always, and they held hands. And, and I saw the teacher that my career was, and I am a very curious person. And so I'm always observing human behavior. That's what an actor does. And I saw so many people in my industry being so miserable and so unhappy and, and so much in this competitive grind. And I, and, uh, and, and what I could see very clearly was that everybody was looking for approval outside of themselves, myself included. And I knew that that was a, a just a dead end. And so the object of the of the game mm-hmm. was I have to give myself my own approval. I can't go asking other people to validate me, even though I desperately wanted that. I, I just knew that that I would never be happy. There was no shot at happiness right? because they'd love you one day and hate you the next. <laughs> and because it's so fickle. And I thought, I'm just going to use this as an opportunity to grow my foundation and who I am. And so I did that. That is so and amazing. I, I would say that I get more idealistic the older I get mm-hmm. instead of less. I just will not let anybody turn me into a cynical, angry person. <laughs> so now let's let's take that and go back to when you did audition for the um the turtles. Right. And I I know I was watching some interviews and it wasn't an easy audition apparently. It wasn't yeah, well, like well, oh my I god, here you are. Let's give it to you. <laughs> you know what? It, I would say Ninja Turtles what, for me it, that wasn't a really hard audition. Getting like I was doing a a film at the time called mm-hmm. Cadillac Man with Robin Williams and Fran Drescher and um, just some really wonderful actors. And I auditioned for Ninja Turtles and I basically got that job on the way home. And I really connected with the director. He did give me some um, direction that I was like, "Uh, this doesn't resonate with me, but I knew if I didn't take the direction, I would never get the job. (laughs) Right. And so, uh, so I got the movie and then they couldn't make the dates work with Cadillac Man, which was the movie I was doing with Robin. And then I lost the movie, but then I got the movie back. And uh, it was definitely uh, something that if you had told me that was what, 30, uh, three years ago, mm-hmm. almost 34 years, which is astonishing to me because right. I feel like I was a kid. Um, and clearly I'm not. Uh, but, um, if you had told me that we'd still be talking about this, that, that this would have anything, any resonance still in my life, I would have said, ha, ha, ha. that's so funny. <laughs> really? You think that, huh? <laughs> it's kind of like the gladiators. We had no idea, no idea how what? big that show was going to be, Yeah, you know, and, well, and look at you, you're like, you know, Amazonian cyber <laughs> amazing <laughs> People who we all just sort of go, how do I do that? Aww. I have to be like her. Oh, that's funny. Because I always went, how do I be like you? I mean, it's like well, all these wonderful acting love- roles. I think that's I think that's also another little bit of secret to my success. I'm an admirer. I'm not a competitor. Mm-hmm. The way that like an athlete is. Mm-hmm. I obviously there are times I'm competing against people for the same job, but I I'm competing with myself. Correct. Always. Yeah. And I really try to take that 
out of the paradigm because I've seen it backfire on people in real time. In the, It's sort of like the universe said, and this is why you don't, am I allowed to swear on this? Oh, please, please do. This is why you don't motherfuck people <laughs> because um, I, I, I've had people do that to me and I've watched them implode because mm-hmm. I've always been like, because it's not in my nature to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, or I catch myself when I am and I go, there's no benefit. You'll be doing this to yourself. And it's and so surprising to me because to me, I look at you and on an acting level, it's like, you're here, you're way up here. And it's like, you, you don't think that in the acting industry that, you know, it's like, I'll audition for these little tiny bit parts here and there. And then I look at someone like yourself and you've had all these amazing roles and so much fun with it that you don't think about someone on your level actually even having that type of competitiveness between each other. Well, there's a couple things. First of all, thank you. Uh, One of the things that um, a couple things. Last man standing wins. So many of the women that, I, you know, I'm fortunate. I don't have to audition like I used to audition. Mm-hmm. Uh, I get a lot offered to me, but what, but but there are times where I, it used to be you'd be in the room. Now everything's on tape. Occasionally, if you're really lucky, you'll meet somebody. Um, oh, and I miss those old days. Oh. But uh, we had such respect for each other. We all knew that everybody was pretty much, you know, talent, everybody had their own unique flavor, but everybody was pretty much at the same level. And if you were still there after all these years, women are really cool or cool women are cool Mm -hmm. who um, celebrate and lift each other up Yes, and compliment each other and mean it and uh, do things to help each other. And so I didn't, I didn't really um, have that. There was the occasional actress that that would happen with and it Mm. was always so interesting to me i always used it as a master class in graciousness Mm -hmm. and kindness and can i can i let my ego evaporate in this moment even though this person is pushing against me really hard Mm -hmm. can can i have the self-control to go back into the story which is the reason why i'm there the story of the character of why I'm here in this room in the first place and leave that bullshit in the waiting room. Yes. That's one thing. The second thing is the industry will. So we just came through the strike and we saw that really a lot of the things was about how people, uh, the, the uh, networks, the film studios, they don't want to share. They want to keep the profits. And then it just goes to that, that, few people above the line. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I realized in the last couple of years and really around COVID, because we all got an opportunity to step back and as I saw that I was really in this toxic relationship with this industry Mm -hmm. for like 40 years, because if it wants to make you believe that you don't have anything to offer that they really need, Right. And you're just lucky to take what they got. And so it creates this environment of lack and limitation. And I see it all the time with people in the creative arts, unfortunately. And I do believe that that's another one of the really big challenges that if you can, if you can find your value outside of the industry, which really aims to keep you down because then they don't have to pay you. Absolutely. You know, I, mm-hmm. I just saw something with Taraji P. Henson talking about how she has to constantly break that ceiling and break that ceiling and break that ceiling. And I I don't know her experience. I am not her. Um, but I, I, and I know that in her case that she sees it as something that has to do with because she is a, a beautiful woman of color. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's industry wide. I think it doesn't matter what you look like or who you are unless you're in this not even a one percent. Because mm-hmm. I was in the top 3% where I earned a living for my entire career. Mm-hmm. Um, but that they really intentionally under don't celebrate your gifts and your talent uh, because then they'd have to pay for it. 
So and it's what, like it's happening to everybody. Oh, everybody. Absolutely. Everywhere in every industry now. <laughs> All over the place. Everywhere. Yes. Yeah. So now what would, have you ever had any pivotal moment in your life to where you went, you know what? I'm done. I'm out of the industry. I don't want to do this anymore. I oh, want to God. go yeah. raise goats. I, I, <laughs> I, I would quit all the time. Like, but, but I would quit for a day. Okay. A yeah. week. I would up until COVID. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I started to, when I came to Nashville to start shooting the series here, I got a chance to get out of LA. And that was a really important thing. That It is a very, I love California. I loved living there for so many years. I've noticed in the last five, 10 years, but really in the past five years, I think because it's so expensive to live there, it's people are grinding 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 nobody's really enjoying their grinding because it's so very very expensive it's so very very competitive there's so many things and leaving that paradigm i saw people who sat on their porch with a glass of wine and knew their neighbors uh -huh. and socialized and it was just a whole different vibe and i went i want that yeah and then the other thing was doing comic cons Mm -hmm. um, which I, you in a million years, that was never a career aspiration of mine ever. I, w I had to be dragged into it. I was not interested. I had a very dear friend of mine who said, you need to go and do this. I was getting a divorce. So I had two homes to pay for my home and my, my ex's home and our children and all that, you know, I had a lot of responsibility and, um, and so I got to meet my fans and you see this out on the road, like the stories that you hear, the um, connection that you have with each other, their connection with us and with what we do and me personally. I mean, suddenly I realized like I wasn't working in a vacuum. Yeah. I was working and, and making my little dent in the universe around the world in a way that my industry would not recognize. You were insp you're inspiring people. And, and, and by people and by all the fans coming up and getting to know you and meet you and physically high, you know, and within two to three feet, you are such an inspiration. And that, uh, by the way, your positive attitude is so refreshing. And people are just, just uh, craving that nowadays. You yeah. know, and I mean, even I, I, when I, I met you, I felt talk. it. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, people come up and we've had, I have real conversations with people because I can't, I can do small talk for a little bit and then I'm yeah. going to go, what's really going on? <laughs> or who are you or really? If comes up, you know, because I'm sure you get it too. People, there's always somebody who comes up and then they melt down. They, they start crying. I'm like, there is a story there. Oh, yeah. And it's always a really, um, it's a story of loss. It's a story of trauma. It's a story of something that's mm -hmm. really challenging. And I like stop the line. It's like, everybody take a seat. Well, we're going to be a minute. <laughs> we're going to be working on this. I'm um, just because I feel like I am the receptacle for the experience for yeah. the person. Cause I, I never assume that it's about me. It's a, it's, I am the reflection of your experience. Oh, I've heard that before. I love that. You're absolutely right. Yeah, so yeah. I, I know that um, we're going to talk a little bit real quickly here about my favorite show. And that was when <laughs> I first saw you, I was like, oh, Nashville. And I was just like, so excited. When this role came about, and I know that you said the script was amazing. You loved it. I mean, tell me a little bit about the experience being on that show. It just, it did. It was just so much fun to watch you. And I mean, the villains, was, well, the I heroes. Like Nashville, Nashville was a life-changing experience in so many ways. Mm -hmm. um, it was the hardest I ever had to fight to get a job and to keep a job. Got it. And... uh I was tested in every single way that you could be tested. And I love the people that I worked with. Um, it was very much a family and all families are incredibly dysfunctional. 
Yes. And I, and it was, uh, it changed my life in the most beautiful ways. And it, um, I think coming to this, this city and being embraced the way that we were having such an incredibly talented cast, we got to go everywhere and meet everybody. I mean, they basically gave us the keys to the city. It was so much fun. And at the same time, I was going through a divorce. <laughs> I had a child melting down. They were all in LA. I was having an identity crisis. I mean, it was just everything. I ended up meeting the love of my life. I mean, it was five years of such intensity in the highest highs and the lowest lows. And I am so grateful to that show and Callie Corey uh, uh, and RJ Cutler, who who they wrote it and brought it together, um, to Connie and Hayden and to uh, Chip and to, you know, there were so many just absolutely amazing people. And I would say we had the greatest crew. Okay, um, I, there I, get, I are, get to ask this question because okay. I was such a fan of the show. Um, hello, what happened to the last season? I mean, oh, m- yeah. meaning that we were all like waiting and waiting and then blah. Yeah, well, you know, um, there were, when the show was dropped by ABC mm-hmm. um, and ABC and Lionsgate, it was always a very tumultuous relationship with them. And then it moved on to country music, CMT, country okay. music television, which was probably always from the start a better fit, mm-hmm. but everything changed. The entire writing staff changed. The showrunners changed. The way that writers work is they get paid by the new characters that they create. Mm-hmm. So characters get dropped because nobody's going to make money off of it. Um, it's it's kind of a, you know, I learned a lot on on this show of, you know, I love my industry so much, the business practices of my industry, as we've seen highlighted, you know, in the last few years and certainly through the strike. Um, it's really out of balance. It really could use yes. some course correction. Yes. And I'm not going to pretend that that is not the case. I'm done with playing yes. that game. I, I will know. not be going along to go along. I saw um, your, I, I, I'll I did. play if you want to play, but I'm not going to pretend I'm not. I, I did. <laughs> I saw the last post on X and it was like, really? I was two weeks late and all of a sudden now you can't vote. Oh, yeah. Well, that Mind was blowing. crazy. Uh, yeah, I was, um, I didn't realize even that I was late paying my dues. I always pay my it dues. It doesn't even it's matter. Not a deal at all. I, and, I mean, 40 years was in the like industry. A major, a major contract that we were going to be voting on. And they're like, yeah, you're two weeks late. It's like, go back and look at the history of me yeah. in this industry. I mean, I would say after COVID, we all lost our minds. I don't yes. know about you. I can't keep track of anything anymore. It's really oh, It's up. crazy. I, I, well, it's almost like we lost that entire year to two years. Yeah. It seems yeah. like, you know, we yeah. go, what year was and that also, again? You know, <laughs> the industry adopted measures that I was not in, you know, I was not down with. And so, you know, I was definitely sidelined. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it's so how really quick. I know we're running on time now. Does social media really play a does it play a, a role with you right now? I mean, do you have to be on social media? Do you not have to be on social media? I mean, at well, the level that you're at, do you oh, want to well, be on it? I would say I use social media. I don't use it as a platform to tell the world what I think unless I am talking very specifically about I I try to stay out of politics. My friends, we will sit and talk politics. I don't do it publicly because I figure there's enough voices out there going at it and it's so dissatisfying all the way around. Um, I think we've all been disillusioned. I think we're all sort of 
uh, at least I am going, what the hell is going on? Well, I think a lot um, of us woke up. Yeah, it was a massive wake up. And um, I feel like for social media, I use it to let people know where I'm going to be next. Mm -hmm. And then I also use it to highlight fans. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a unique and extraordinary pleasure of working with Debbie Reynolds. And when we did the Halloween Town movies together. And she was the one who, I mean, she just, she traveled with pictures. She was always signing autographs. She was talking to everybody. And I remember one day, it took so long to get from our trailers to the set because she kept stopping and talking <laughs> to people. And, you know, they're going, we need Debbie and Judith. We need Debbie and Judith. And <laughs> I was joking with her and I loved her to death. And I said, oh, my God, girl, you would pose with a coat hanger. And she <laughs> looked at me and she gave me a look. And, you know, if Debbie gives you a look, you're going to. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And she said, Judith, you are nothing. If you don't have fans. Aww. And I didn't. I was like, well, you're an icon. You're Debbie Reynolds. You have fans. I don't have fans. And it really like. I didn't realize like that was something I was. So, that I had or mm -hmm. that I was supposed to embrace and, and take care of and invite in. Yes. And so I use social media for that exclusively very rarely do i do personal posts do i talk about you know i think i was listening the other day to somebody who was saying you know they missed movie stars because they lived behind this sheen of loveliness and now mm -hmm. everybody posts their meals and what they think at the <laughs> drop of a hat and the sheen is gone <laughs> I Nobody always say cares. I always say we can see in J Lo's closet now, so who cares? <laughs> you know, right, it's like exactly. you know, and, yeah. And so I feel like nobody really needs to know what I think. You you think what you think, and I'm gonna love you for it, and I'm gonna just be doing my thing over here and trying to. I feel like what's really needed right now are people who are willing to be bridges instead Judith, of. You're Absolutely. What you're saying right now is so needed. It's yeah, absolutely it's insane. Like, stop fighting. Stop bickering. Stop saying I'm right. You're wrong. And since you're wrong, I don't want to talk to you any longer. We need right. the bridges. We need people to, need you know what? Bridges. You do you. You do you. I still love you. It doesn't matter what you're doing or what side you're on well, or what you believe. When I, when I moved to Tennessee, like when I decided to really just leave LA and move here, um, I had people, I was really living in a confirmation bubble in Los Angeles. There is only one way to think if you want to be in the club. And when I came out here, I met people who did not necessarily think the way that I thought. And they were so, they embraced me so much and were so open and were so willing to have a conversation. And nobody necessarily was going to change their position except that everybody was really willing to have conversations with each other, really civil conversations. And what I found was, oh, we're not different. Like it's being portrayed that we are different. We're not, we're actually the same. We actually care about the same things. And when you sit down and break bread with somebody, you realize that we have so much more in common than not. And if, and if we continue to let this media structure di divide us and keep us apart and find more and more ways to keep us fighting, I won't do it. I'm going to just keep finding ways to find consensus and to find common ground or to say, agree to disagree. Absolutely. Let's um, go have a beer, <laughs> you know? And, and that's the, that is the most refreshing attitude. And I love that. God, it's so fun to sit and talk and listen to someone like yourself. And I know that you actually started something called Wake Up Wednesdays, right? And yes, you kind of uh, back you know, and forth on that a little a bit. Yeah. And it was really about, it, it happened during COVID, you know, we had so much time and I saw so many people suffering and I had one of those COVID experiences where I was in bliss. Mm -hmm. I was like, living in my house is in the woods. I, I had every, you know, I had, I've set up my life in a way that I, I it's comfortable. Um, it's not extravagant. It's just a real lovely life. And I saw so many people who were really suffering and struggling and waking up and being, you know, when you wake up, it is one of the most painful experiences because everything you thought you knew 
doesn't really sit with you anymore and you don't know, well, what, who are you and what are you about? And so I just thought I'm going to just start talking to people. And I, I, I really love engaging. And there's a part of me that goes, how I go back and forth with, am I going to keep doing it? Am I not going to do it? Because again, do we, do, who cares what I think? <laughs> Everybody cares what you think. <laughs> you <know? laughs> That's what's so like, funny about it. Like, <laughs> like oh, good. The folks going to tell us her opinion about this. Like, oh, <laughs> All right. You know, so all we get are opinions out there. And there's a part of me that goes, maybe it's, uh, it's just all better done in person, maybe. And then all of a sudden, I'll have this impulse where it's like, oh, I've got to say something about this. <laughs> right. Because people are really <laughs> struggling with this. And I'm all about where, what's our solutions. So before I let you go, tell me about the nice little sign you have in your hallway. If you still have it in your hallway, life is always working out for me. I do still have it in my hallway. And it's funny because my house is under construction and I keep moving my little sign around to like the next wall that hasn't been beaten up and drywalled <laughs> or taken down. I do because I life works out the best for those who make the best of the way that life works out. I, I, I believe it was a, what's his name? He was a basketball coach. I think that was his saying. Um, well, oh, what's his name? I forget. Anyway. It's not my quote. I I heard it, and I I was like, yeah, we just everybody's dealt the set of cards that they're dealt. I see some people who have experienced horrific things that I cannot imagine, and they have built these absolutely beautiful lives. I see people who've also had traumatic, awful things happen, and they are just stuck in mm -hmm. a cycle of trauma. And I feel like the resilience and the beauty of what is possible for each individual soul is something I will always champion and celebrate and try to shine a light on. And um, for those that aren't going in that direction, I bow before the grace of your path. I don't necessarily understand those choices, uh, but I do wish the very best for everyone. And I think if, if we don't feel that way, we're really in trouble. We're, we're at a precipice. Mm -hmm. And if we don't start really being champions of ourselves and each other, we're in trouble. So the half, the, the glass is always half full with you. And I love that. Yeah. Even if yes. it's empty. <laughs> exactly. I can imagine it. Because <laughs> it's going to be half full at one point in time. <laughs> half full. I figure life is an illusion. I can delude myself in any way that I want. I can either delude myself that it's all going great or it's all going horribly. And I think it was Einstein who said, you know, one of the most important choices a person makes, I'm butchering this, is is life inherently safe or is life inherently dangerous? And mm. depending on the choice you make, your life goes in that direction. And I'm going to go safe and beautiful. I like that. And now, I see, know there's I, I danger always, around every corner, but whatever. I always say your life is your own script. You're 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 the you're the hero in your story, or you're the villain in your story. You're writing it. You get to write your life the way you want to write it. Right. You know. And so right. it, that's it's it's just one of the things a lot of people don't get it, unfortunately. Yeah. And yeah. it's just kind of mind blowing to me. But yeah. you know, we can't we can't save everyone. But I no. want to be very respectful of your time. I know you have a class and you're five minutes past. And I just want to oh, thank you so, so sweet, much. Lori. I, I can't thank wait you. till the next time we see each other, we have to make sure that we grab a little time, go oh, grab please. a cup of coffee or a martini or, a, some, or just hang out in the green room. I would love that. And, and thank you, you so much. Oh, you don't even invite me because I'll be on your your porch probably in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> I love, don't come now. The house is but I, but once it's done, it should be done in a couple more months. I so want to um, get there. I've never day. been there. I've never been there. Nashville's a great. There, you know, it's one of the cities that everybody's moving to. I know. Everybody should stop now. See, they there you go. You're like, cities. all right, stop. Find somewhere else. <laughs> but I will say, uh, the quality of life here is. Uh, way better. And I love California. I think it's an absolutely beautiful state. My heart is broken for what's happening there. 
Yes. Um, I just saw a video of Oakland, California today, and I thought this reminds me of Soweto, South Africa. It's absolutely terrible. Uh, it's like a shanty town, and it's mm-hmm. very, very sad. And mm-hmm. and you know, I do believe it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't. We the only thing going for California right now, to be quite honest with you, is our weather. You know, and that's pretty and much been it. Beaten up by your weather. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> So, so, so as soon as as soon as the weather goes, fires are going to start. <laughs> exactly, it's but flooding, it it's fires. Beautiful, it and is wonderful people. I always um, tell I tell my mom, I go, mom, I love you, but the minute you're gone, I'm out of Cali. You know, yeah, I do. I, I I'm know, out. I'm I, my kids are still there, and I I've built a house where I've got enough room that if everybody needed to just show up on my door and come live with me, I've got the space for them. Oh, that's I ha- I'm awesome. on, you know, 20 acres. We can build little cabins. My <gasps> do you have horses and cows people. and goats and chickens? And do you have Wait, a farm? Yeah. Well, my neighbors certainly have those. I I have two killer cats who've <laughs> driven out every mole and chipmunk and squirrel for miles. Every day there's a <laughs> new gift. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Judith, thank you so much. And yes, we. I'm sure that throughout this year, we will see each other again. I'll That'd see where you're at in the Comic-Cons. I'll come by your table. I'll grab Yay! you and say, I'm stealing her for five minutes. Yes, and yes, thank yes. you so much for taking the time on my podcast today. I know that we're crunch time, but thank you again. I so appreciate it. My pleasure. I love you. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much. Have a great week. Bye, love. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone, for listening to Chillin' with Ice. And this is where legends live on. Thank you so much for listening to Chillin' with Ice. And don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and share wherever you listen to your podcast. Remember to follow us on Patreon and YouTube at Chillin' with Ice. And on Instagram and TikTok, you can follow me at lori.ice.fetrick. I look forward to chilling with you next time here on Chillin' with Ice.